Tim, how do you feel about the fact that Hemman Hill is still Hemman Hill? Because we had a big discussion yesterday over there whether you, it's whether you it sounds surprised. Well, by no, that. I mean I, I always call it Hemman Hill, but <laughs> there's a sort of Murray Mound no, momentum no, going. But no. it's always. It, do you love that? Do you, are you proud of that? <laughs> every time, every time I'm commentating and there's a you know we go out to, to the hill, I always say that's my hill, and there it is again. There's my hill. <laughs> But no, it's amazing. I, as I said, you know, I was here as a six-year-old in 19, 1981. I came here for the first time to watch, and and now, you know, to have had all the memories and the, the matches that I've had on centre court, and then to have, you know, kind of part of the ground named after me. It's 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 yeah, it's amazing. It's brilliant. Of course, something that wasn't there um, when that was named Henman Hill it was the roof on yeah. the centre court. And last night with Rafa and uh, Lucas Russell, uh, they closed the roof. Maybe questionable, maybe not. It took half an hour. That yeah. obviously had an impact on the match. Uh, what do you think? I mean, I know you're, you're on, on certain committees here. You're a member of the All England Club. What's your take on, on the roof and the fact that it's going to take half an hour to get the match going again? Yeah, I mean, in an ideal world, you'd like it to take five minutes. But with the nature of the roof and the crowd and the grass, you obviously have to get the humidity and the air conditioning right. That's as quick as it can be done. Um, did it have an impact on the match? Yeah, I think it did. Um, you know, Rafa had the momentum. He'd won the four set 6-2. And then you have a, an interruption. Um, I really think that it is, it's making the best of a difficult situation because they probably only had another 15 minutes of light. Um, do you stop the fifth set at one all or two all? Or do you say, OK, this is a convenient time? And, and I think for me, that, that probably was the right time. Um, I think you reflect on what happened in the French Open final. Yeah. You know, there was eight games in a row for Djokovic and it starts raining and Rafa was able to, you know, regroup, come back the next day. Did that favour him? Absolutely. But that's, that's the way it goes sometimes. And, and um, you know, Rossol did an unbelievable job of then coming out and, and playing the fifth set as he did. So I think on the whole, you know, today it's um, the roof's been in use. It's, it's a great asset for the tournament. When we can guarantee play for the media, the fans and, and the players, then... Let's hope, you know, there could be one on court one one day. And well, how do you read the little body check, the little Boris Becker that Nadal threw to uh, yeah. Lucas Russell? I hadn't seen that one before, but uh, not from Rafa. We've but, just um, got to interrupt you. I'm sorry, because first of all, we'll tell you that Djokovic is two breaks up over there under the roof on centre court. But we've just got to pop in and see Rob very briefly. Well, you can't see me, but you can see two winners because... Danielle Bracciali and Julian Noll, the Italian and the Austrian, have just knocked out the number one men's double seeds, Max Mernier and Daniel Nesta. 6-4, 6-4, 6-4. They let out a big roar towards the end of the match. We're between court five and court six. It's absolutely packed here because news was spreading that the number one seeds were under pressure. They came out. We showed you a little bit of action at the start of the third set after they'd lost the first two, 6-4, 6-4. But the... Uh, able duo from Italy and Austria have just booked themselves a place in the next round at the expense of the number one seeds. Big pats on the back, a few autographs as well as they make their way up the stairs back underwards, under the uh, shadow of centre court where Djokovic is, well, what are they? He's 3-0 up on the, uh, in the third set there. So the two guys have just caused a major upset here in the men's doubles. The number one seeds have gone and we will be seeing Bracciali and Noll in the next round. So a shock in the doubles. Just briefly going back to Nadal, because I've got a tweet from Adam H12. He says, ask Tim, was Rafa getting beaten yesterday the biggest shock in your time at Wimbledon? Well, um, I think it probably was. Uh, I remember when um, Karlovic beat Hewitt as the defending champion. Um, you know, that was a big upset, but I felt that, you know, Karlovic obviously got a good grass court game and um, it was always going to be dangerous if you serve like that. But um, I, I think in my time, when you've got Rafa's record and, and how well he plays on grass, French Open champion, world number two, I think that was the biggest upset for me. If you want to tweet us, by the way, it's at live at Wimbledon if you have any more questions for Tim. Um, I've got a question for you, Tim, actually. During the times that you, you were at the semi-final and, and or things just never quite worked out for you here, did you dream about winning Wimbledon ever? I, mean, I still do. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> it was always my dream to win Wimbledon. But um, it was... Um, no, and, and that's where, you know, when I reflect, I, I, I would say I was good enough to win Wimbledon, but I think there were people that were better than me. And when I look at those matches and, you know, I lost to Sampras twice, I lost to... Um, even Isovic in a you know a pretty tricky match over three days, and I and I lost to Leighton Hewitt, who was world number one. I don't really have any, I don't really have any complaints. You know, I, I had so much um, 
I had so many great times and great memories and great victories out there. And, and yeah, sure, I would have loved to have won it, but um, no, I'm still, I'm still pretty content with with what went on. Particularly the game against Ivan Isevich, which I, I was mentioning actually the other day on Live at Wimbledon, that I was so cross with the weather. I was so <laughs> cross that you were interrupted in your flow. Yeah. How long did it take you to get over that? Or, did, or did, were you um, always over it? Not as long as, as um, you as know, me. people think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wasn't... I, I've always had a pretty good perspective on things. And sure, I was disappointed. You know, it was weird that... Um, I remember sort of coming on the Sunday because we started on the Friday. Sunday was the finals, normally the finals day. And we resumed at 3-2 in the fifth. And we played four games. And, and um, I lost my serve once and lost, that ma uh, lost the final set 6-3. And I remember getting back to the locker room. And we'd only played 15 minutes. And normally there's a massive build-up of sort of emotion and adrenaline. And, and you use up a lot of energy. And I remember sitting in the, in the locker room afterwards thinking, was that it? You know? It was the semi-final of Wimbledon. It felt very surreal, and then obviously, the next day when it was the it was the Monday and Rafter and even Ipswich played, and and I didn't sit down and watch it, but I certainly knew it was going on. Then it then it sort of hit me of what an opportunity it was. But you know, by the middle to end of that week, I was you know pretty. I'd probably played 36 or 48 holes of golf by <laughs> then, and and I was ready to move on. Yeah. And you've got a hill named after you, so what more do you need? Exactly, there's a silver lining to everything. Yeah, yeah. you are involved over here uh, yeah. with the scheduling, uh, I believe, a little bit. I'm on, uh, I'm, I'm on the main tournament board and, and we have a, a tennis subcommittee which, which, does the, um, which does the order of play. Mm -hmm. It's quite tricky for me with my media commitments to sort of get involved with the actual daily order of play, but um, theoretically I, I am and, and sometimes um, you know, I'll speak on the phone, but they normally get on without uh, get on without me. Yeah. And how do you deal when players complain about being moved over onto the, the less showy of the show courts? Yeah, I tell them it's the same size out there and you know if it's women win two sets and if it's men win three sets you'll be fine. So <laughs> um, But you don't get involved not... I mean when Baltacha wasn't very happy that she was on court two, do you do you No, I I, I um do you just keep out of it? <laughs> yeah, I, I sort of keep out of it. But but at the end of the day, you know, there aren't too many bad courts here, you know, the the uh, it's, it's an amazing place to play and, and um, you know, they've, they've got great show courts now. We've got a new court two, a new court three, and, and I'm sure that will be expanded over, over time. So, um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, if you keep winning, I'm sure you'll end up in the, on the show courts at, at some stage. I'm going to ask you about the Olympics, because did you ever play in Olympics? I did, yeah. Yeah, I did. I played in... Um, I played in three That's Olympics. Right. You and, won a silver uh, medal. I won a silver medal in. Um, did that, was that someone in your ear? It was. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, as I said that, I thought I seem to remember silver medal, but I couldn't have told you whether it yeah, was. Yeah, I did. It was. I mean, it was a funny one because um, growing up, you know, this was what tennis was all about for me, and I never, I never dreamt of playing in the Olympics. But I was a massive fan of sport, and and so when I had the opportunity, I think, in all honesty, in the first year, I was quite interested in watching all the other sports as, as well as playing and, and um, you know as it was it just uh, was an amazing experience I played in Atlanta Sydney and Athens and, and now I think tennis in the Olympic movement has really gained a lot of momentum you've had you know Federer talking about playing um, in uh, at Wimbledon for the 2012 games for about the last four years and all the top players are going to be are going to be here so it's going to be great to watch I'm going to ask you that question because they have ranking points for the Olympics mm. and uh, it's uh, like a 750 tournament yeah. on the ATP tour what's your take on should there be ranking points should there be twice as many ranking points to win the Olympics compared to Wimbledon where are we going here I, I think you know why if it's only every four years and and it's such a prestigious event you know could it be I think the ranking points should be up there with a slam. It's yeah. only going to be every four years, but it's um, you know it's such an, a major event. On the, you know on the other side of the coin, I think the uh, the Olympics is is the pinnacle of sport. So you know should it need ranking points? You know the players should be so motivated by a gold medal. But um, it does seem slightly bizarre that if they are going to give it ranking points, that it is so far down the pecking order. Mm. Um, do you do you like your other sports? I know you I know you yeah. like your horses actually. Your wife's very horsey, isn't she? No, yeah, we, let's get that straight. My wife likes them. <laughs> <laughs> you know I was going to no, no, I'm a bit scared ask. of them. I'm a bit scared of them. Well, I think your wife, actually, her trainer has also trained me. But anyway, oh, I can't okay. talk about that. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask you about Beckham, actually. Have you got an opinion on Beckham being being omitted from the Olympic team? Um, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because I know that if he had been included, there would have been a lot of people that would have said, oh, you've only included him to sell shirts and sell tickets. So it's probably a bit of a no-win situation. I, I would have liked to have seen him. You know, he's done a, he's done a, um, a massive amount for... 
for sport, for football, and and for the Olympics, and was part of the bid process. So um, yeah, I think he would have certainly he would have certainly got my vote. And um, you know, he's been an amazing servant for for English football. He's got 115 caps. So perhaps it would have been a good way for good opportunity for him to finish his international career. But um, Stuart Pearce got to make decisions. He made a decision, and that's what he's there to do. OK, Tim, I put you on the spot there slightly, but thank you. Very good answer. Thanks very much for joining us. No problem Maybe at all. Maybe we can see you again in yeah, the rest absolutely. of the fortnight. Thanks for having me. We'll see